Is it is it sharing? Yeah, looks great. Okay, of course I can't see you folks anymore, but is that right? You can't see us if you're sharing the screen. You can see only the screen now, right? You can't see me. We can see you only now, no screen. Well, what happened? I don't know. So we're seeing you now. Huh. We saw the screen share for a second there. Hold on. Okay. I seem to have lost um, screen sharing privileges here. What a pain. Hold on. Sorry, guys. It's all right. Try it again, or if you need to hang up and come back in, that's fine, too. We'll be here. All right, let me try that. Notice he's got a slanted roof, too. That's the new in thing, It's apparently, is slanted roofs uh, in, <laughs> in buildings there. So. OK, so before we get started, you, you've read Sri's bio. Um, and while we're waiting for it to come in, we can try, well, let's try that screen sharing again just to make sure you got it. All right, you're frozen. We see something. You see that? Are they yes. changing? Yep, they are. Okay, so there's no indication on my side, Andrew, whether I'm on or not, because now there's no picture and there's nothing, so. Right, but, but we are seeing. I mean, we're seeing the uh, screens. Okay, good. So, so I can make faces, right? You can make faces. You can take off your shirt if you want. We couldn't tell. So uh, <laughs> here we are. So I'll give you. I'll give folks the thirty-second intro because they've all read your bio. Sure. And um, for the for the on the off chance there are some people watching on Google Hangouts on air, which I doubt there are. Um, Sri Srinivasan is the first chief digital officer of the Metropolitan Museum, and he came to the Met after being the chief digital officer of Columbia University, actually the first chief digital officer of any major university, I believe, right, Sri? In, yeah, it, of, of sorts. Uh, Harvard has one, but it was a completely different job. So in, in the role that I was, it was, I was the first, yeah. Right. And for many years, Sri and I taught together at the Columbia J School. He has been, kind of, for the last decade, the man around town in terms of journalism, new media, and leading the charge to modernize journalists. He's famous actually for going to news organizations all around the world and preaching uh, social media before social media became a thing. And Sri and I are part of the, the young punks in the 1990s who helped modernize the journalism school of Columbia. Even though it had a very high reputation, it wasn't very modern. It was actually like pulling teeth just to get internet access into the classroom at the time. So we've come a long way. And now look at Sri. He's the chief digital officer of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, widely regarded as the premier institution or the cultural institution in the world dealing with um, arts and humanities. So I thought he'd be a perfect speaker given that the premise of this class is trying to explore the intersection of news and journalism in terms of uh, breaking uh, news and recording breaking news and then the institutions that have traditionally dealt with history and archiving things and then Wikipedia which is on the forefront of harnessing the crowd to do both of those things in terms of reporting the news and writing history at the same time. So Sri is one of these folks who's crossed over from the journalism world into this world, but helping to pull both fields along at the same time. So Sri, um, I'm going to hand it over to you and uh, tell us what you do and how you got there. Sure, thanks. And uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to spend some time talking to Andrew's class. I um, Andrew is very, very modest, as you might know. Um, everything I know about digital, I learned from Andrew. And he's the reason I have a career in digital journalism. And uh, you folks are very lucky to spend time with him. Um, and um, so I'm, I'm glad to uh, get this chance to speak to you. Um, Andrew, as I said, I have no, I have no. There's nothing on the screen that tells me if I cut off either the picture or the audio. So just speak up if you don't, if you, if you, if I drop out, please. Okay. That's good. Great. Okay. Um, and um, so anyway, so I, uh, I thought I'd share some slides about my journey about going to the Met 
and what I do here, and then we can just kind of open this up and take as many questions as you have. And Andrew, we have about 30, 40 minutes. What's yeah. your, yeah? Okay. As much Good. time as you can get. Yeah, 30, 40 is fine. Okay, great. So I have been at the Met now for six months. It'll be exactly six months uh, next week. And uh, the first person I called uh, when I have any major uh, things that I have to discuss is Andrew, and I not only got his guidance in ending up with this job, but also uh, his, uh, you know, his strong endorsement uh, put me in this job that I'm in now. And um, it's people are always asking, what is a chief digital officer uh, do at the Met, and why does the Met need one? So what I do is I have a team of about 70 people who work on all the kinds of things that I'm interested in, that Andrew knows I love, uh, things like video, interactives, apps, mobile, social, geolocation, web, data, email, things like that, which I care a lot about. And this was an opportunity to take all of that here at the Met and get that seen by the world and get more people to see it. And that's what I, I do here. Uh, Andrew, if any, at any point, if anyone has a question, just if you will speak up, I'll just, uh, if you will interrupt, I'll just answer the question. Okay, we don't have to wait till the end. Great. And um, uh, what we, so what, what I do is we have teams who work on these various uh, issues. We have a team that has, uh, we also have a media lab here, which I'll talk about in a little bit. We have two Google Glass, what is the plural of Google Glass, by the way? I don't know what it is, but who, <laughs> who Google Glass Eye or Glass Eye, Glass Says uh, here at the Met, uh, 3D printing, all kinds of things. We're trying to figure out the future of museums as well. I call this job of the chief digital officer as the chief listening officer, meaning my job is to kind of listen to folks all across the museum who have uh, projects and try to help them think through how we can make the museum more digital as we do this. So at the Met, that's a whole lot of listening. Last year, we had 6.3 million visitors in person. We have 2 million square feet of gallery space, 40 special exhibitions a year. Uh, and then on the online side, we have 24 million unique visitors a year, 40 million visits, and about 135 plus million web uh, page views. So you can see that we also generate a lot of data here at the Met, and that's something we, we think a lot about. I thought it'd be fun if you're going to have someone talk to you from a museum that we give you a whole series of art breaks during the conversation. So I'm going to show you some of our, uh, some pictures from our Instagram and social media feeds just to show you some of the things we're doing. So here, for example, is uh, the Grand Staircase from 1919 at the Met. And this is from our, um, from our Instagram feed. And I'll show you. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about our social media strategy a little later if you want to dig into it. But uh, this is uh, one of those art breaks that I wanted you to have. Here's another. Uh, it's very cold and snowy up here in New York. Uh, I forget, I, I've lost track of what the weather down in Washington is today. But uh, I thought maybe we could all use an escape to the seaside uh, here in 1892, a William Merritt Chase uh, American art. So what are the lessons that I've learned uh, in the six months I've been here? Number one, it's about storytelling. Everything we do uh, here at the Met is really about getting the word out on, uh, on the objects and on the pictures and uh, every, everything that we have here in the collection. And so we, we, we are able to do that and work on that in, um, in different ways. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, so... Well, what we are constantly thinking about is how do we tell the stories in our collection. So let me see if I can pull this up here. Um, this is, uh, if, if you folks, we, we won't have time now, but if you Google the words fine dining, 82nd and 5th, you will see an example of how we tell stories. What you can see here is like an ancient spork, right? You see a spoon and fork combination. But this is from a video series we've got called 82nd and 5th, which is the address, 82nd Street and 5th Avenue in New York of the Metropolitan Museum. And what we have is um, a series of uh, curators talking about their favorite works of art. So we have two-minute videos on YouTube and elsewhere that you can find of experts talking about uh, 
their favorite art objects. So here, one of our curators talks about what I what what he calls kind of the iPhone of ancient Rome. Uh, this is a really fun piece. This was uh, a, a a a people then obviously didn't have gadgets, but this was the kind of gadget that you would have. Uh, the way we now pull out an iPhone 5s and put it on a, uh, uh, you know, at a dining table, uh, they used to use this to kind of show off um, at, at these ancient Roman uh, dinner parties. But it was also a very practical tool because um, ancient Romans, it turns out, used to rest on a uh, on a kind of sofa where their one arm would be resting and holding them up, and they needed uh, a spoon. And a, and a fork that they could use, operate with one hand, so they wouldn't have a knife and fork combination. So this is the kind of detail that, as journalists, we know that these are the details that make a story. And if you watch this two-minute clip, you will absolutely love, I hope, this, this particular uh, one piece of art that we have here among you know, hundreds of thousands of pieces of art. But we have to focus on the storytelling, and that's very important to what we do. Another lesson that I've learned is that media outlets and museums uh, have both obsessed about social media, and we know about everything that's going on in, in news organizations about social media, but here we're going to talk a little bit about what we're doing at the Met, and as I said, if you have an interest, we can kind of dig deeper. Uh, here it shows you the range of channels that we have um, uh, where we're sh uh, we have different uh, 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 you know, levels of presence on, on social media. Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, Foursquare, Flickr, YouTube, and you can see that these all become part of the way the Met connects with the world. Um, Andrew had very kindly invited me down to campus uh, earlier uh, this academic year, and we had a really good conversation about social media and where things are going, and um, I, I found uh, Andrew's students are very, very interested, just like they, ha they are in almost all communication schools about trying to figure this out. The fact is that no one's figured it out and we're all in this together and that's why we're constantly trying to keep up with all the changes that are happening in social media. Uh, what I tell folks is that you don't need to be first on any of these platforms but you should try and figure them out when they make sense to you. When social media fits into your workflow and your life flow, that's when you want to get involved with it. Hey, Sri. Let's take quick. time for an art break. Uh, here is a Sri, quick question, dancers Sri. practicing in 1877, and this is uh, uh, a picture that we threw up on, uh, so on on Instagram and got a lot of uh, feedback on. Hey, Sri, can you hear me? Uh, now, having talked about social media, another important lesson is that everyone will miss almost everything you do on social media, and that's something that you have to keep in mind, that we spend all this energy and time creating social media products, sending things out on social media. But just because you do that doesn't mean people will see what you're doing and what's being said out there. So that's something to also keep in mind when you do this, that j just because you do the social media doesn't mean that people will see the social media. Time for another art break. Here is uh, we have this rooftop at the Met where we do an art commission from a contemporary artist. And here's an example of a little story that I think you might like. Um, this w was this, uh, uh, he, Imran is a Pakistani artist who did, um, uh, uh, who paints these flowers that look like blood on our, uh, and so he did this on our rooftop. While he was installing it last April, uh, the Boston bombing happened, uh, the Boston Marathon. And he decided that the artwork, which was going to go all the way to the end of that wall that you see there, the far wall, he decided that he was going to stop it in this straight line because it would remind people of the Boston Marathon where the bombing happened at the finish line, as you might remember, just near the finish line. So this is an example, again, of art. artists have ideas, have inspiration, have ways of communicating what our job is, as folks who work in a museum in digital media, is to get that seen by as many people uh, as possible. Now, here's another lesson about social media. Almost everyone will miss almost everything you do until you make a mistake. Then everyone will see what you're doing 
on social. So that's something to keep in mind as well. And we have seen too many journalists and too many students get in trouble over this. Um, Andrew, can you still hear me? Yes. Can you hear us? Andrew? Hello. Hello. <laughs> ah, sorry, Andrew? Yes. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can. Were you, okay. Were, is Great. it also working? It is working now. We tried uh, asking you a question before, but... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> did, I just keep, did I talk over you? I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, no, it's perfectly fine. One quick okay. question. Um, I was shocked to see your Pinterest followers were almost as many as your Twitter followers. Is that a surprise to you or yeah, not? Yes, yes, yes it is. And um, our Pinterest numbers, and by the way, we joined Pinterest I think two years after we joined Twitter, if not more. Um, part of it is, as your students can guess, is because it's so visual. Uh, and we find that people on Pinterest come, uh, who come to the website, come uh, more often, stay longer, and go deeper than people who come from, uh, than other visit, other referrals to our website. So Pinterest is absolutely critical to what we do. So it's maybe, I mean, Pinterest, you can't really compare directly with Twitter or Facebook. It's visual, so it has a whole different type of model of engagement, right? That's right. Cool. But the people who love it really get, get into it. And I'm sure some of your students are on Pinterest and they know that feeling. Right. Kind of obsessing about it. Good. Uh, let's move on. So time for another art break. Um, here is an example of one of the changes we made at the Met this year. The Met was open. Um, it was closed. Sorry, it was open six days a week. Closed on Mondays, and now it's open on Mondays. Uh, the whole point of having a friend at the Met was to come on Mondays so you could walk around when it's empty. Um, now you'll have to come earlier in the day and or stay late and walk around. But this is an example of people get used to uh, and, and, and get comfortable with something, and you won't believe how hard it was at first to get the word out that the Met was open after being closed all these years, right, for decades. Suddenly it's open on Mondays. So getting the word out on something like that has been one of the challenges that we've had. And it just tells you, even great good news that people want to know they won't necessarily find it, and you have to work very, very hard to get the word out on that stuff. Um, one of the things that happens is that all the changes that come to Facebook, everybody frets about. And uh, the fact is that, um, that uh, something that I learned uh, teaching with Andrew, we used to talk about this, that uh, this too shall pass, right? People are always worried about the formula being changed, uh, something's going to happen, journalists' work is going to be less seen or more seen. It's it, it, it constantly something that people worry about all the time. Uh, uh, you folks won't believe this, but uh, back when Andrew and I were first doing all this, instant messaging was something that parents used to worry about. And uh, they would ask for help and, and advice on how to keep uh, their kids off instant messaging. And uh, you can imagine that, you know, people just kind of fit into their lives and people used it and uh, and they moved on many more scary things have come along so that's one of the things that I tell people who worry about trying to figure out the Facebook formula for the algorithm don't worry you know do what you have what you need to do but don't worry so much about about it uh, because it will keep changing here's another art break uh, this is uh, one of the uh, uh, prayer niches that we have here and uh, uh, as part of our very extensive Islamic collection, Islamic art collection. And I, if, you, uh, if you haven't uh, seen today's news, uh, a very interesting uh, uh, collection, a very prized collection has been loaned to the Dallas Museum of Art, making it now the third best uh, collection of Islamic art in the US after the Met and the Freer and Sackler, Sackler Galleries right there in DC. So uh, there's a lot of news today about uh, Islamic art online right now. Uh, let's see. Media companies know their future is tied to success on mobile, and that's the same thing for us in museums. And so we spend a lot of our energy and uh, our program building out our Met app, uh, but also our mobile um, mobile website is very important for us that we have a comprehensive program. It's not just let's just have an app, but have a mobile website connected to our uh, our app, 
and a way to get into our audio guide because we want to get people to access our information. Our audio guide has 3,000 stops on it, which is very extensive. And what we're doing is putting it all online, available free. And so what we say to people is, when you come to a museum, if you want to, uh, uh, if you want to just get the content, we'll give it to you for free. But if you're worried, as many people are, about bandwidth and about uh, excess charges and their battery, then we will. You can use our devices, and for that, you pay money. But as I understand, in DC, everything is free, right? All audio guides and uh, all admission, right, Andrew, to all museums. All admission is, I think. They charge for audio guides at many of the uh, museums, but not okay. much, not much. OK, good. Uh, here's another uh, art break, but this is a view of the museum itself uh, and uh, Central Park. It doesn't look like that's today. It's a beautiful day out uh, uh, and when this picture was taken. Today is all snow covered. And that's the Jackie Onassis Reservoir that you see there. This is Jack Jackie Kennedy. It's named after her and the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art right there, Fifth Avenue on the right side, Central Park West on the other side. Uh, let's go to another lesson. Despite all the fuss about social media, email still counts. There is so much noise around email, about, about around social media and how that's the future, and it is the future, but we should never, ever underestimate the power of email. Email is what makes the world go round. Email is what you use to get someone's real attention. Uh, email is what is the way in which you're able to connect and get things done. And uh, so even in a time of texting and social and everything else, email still counts. And uh, I, I encourage folks to have email newsletters. We, um, uh, I was involved in the creation of a startup uh, here in New York, a, a local, a hyperlocal news website uh, called Digital News and Information, dnainfo.com. And what we have, uh, you know, our, the newsletter was one of the number one ways in which we were able to drive traffic. So email still counts. Here is another uh, art break, and uh, this is the European Sculpture Court. And uh, you can see one of the hashtags on here is empty met, which is one of the things that people do when the met is empty and they were able to come in on, on, the, uh, on uh, Mondays. Another lesson is that media outlets usually work on incredibly short deadlines, and museums work on incredibly long deadlines. Fortunately, I come from the academic world where we're used to long deadlines, right, Andrew? But uh, <laughs> yeah. otherwise, the, the change is quite stunning for, like, journalists will call in the morning and expect to file a story. They used to expect to file a story by 5 p.m. because they would need it for the paper. But nowadays, Andrew, I'm sure you've seen that when you get requests from journalists, it's for like in the next hour because they have to publish. It happened today. My phone's been ringing off the hook because an email because uh, you may have seen the news about a, um, the new CEO of Microsoft who happens to be Indian American. Um, and not all Indians know each other, though it might feel that way. Uh, <laughs> I've been asked a bunch of questions about what it means for the community to have him, uh, you know, so all of this. But they're not even calling to ask for the afternoon or the evening. They're out calling to ask for the next few minutes. Uh, so that's something that I've seen that's been pretty dramatic uh, uh, a change. And so it's, a, uh, but the museum world doesn't operate that way at all. Well, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that our exercise for the last 45 minutes is for all 20 students here to improve that article about the new Microsoft CEO. So we'll, oh, excellent. we'll have something to show for it at the end. Oh, good, good, good. I'd love to hear uh, well, how, that, how that goes. That, that's great. And I, I hope you will on, not only look at US uh, media sources, but uh, this is huge news in India. And uh, some of the most important newspapers in the world are in India, including the Times of India, which is the largest circulation uh, English language newspaper in the world. They're all running stories about him, and they have much more detail about his life and his um, especially his younger days, uh, where he went to college in India, high school in India. So if you want to get those facts right, you'll want to explore those sources as well. We might be contacting. One of the disputes now is whether he went to Mangalore University or Manupal, and I think there's some dispute about that. 
Yeah. What, so what? What? That's a good exercise. So what? What? What's a way to uh, to confirm confirm that? Call the university. Yeah, which is hard. Which might be hard with the time difference. It's exactly. now two, it's like one thirty a.m. So what I would do is I would go to the websites of both universities because his name has been in the news for the last two weeks mm -hmm. uh, uh, as a potential CEO. See which one has actually done and run an interview with him or said he's an alum or go back and look at the alumni record, you know, like their alumni hall of fame. Right. Uh, where he went, but you're right. Uh, Whoops, do we lose you? Oop, I think we lost you. Monika, you had a question? No, I was saying, you probably looking at the LinkedIn, but that's how the question probably had. It's good. Well, one of the groups that I'm going to have do this is going to have to figure out, get to the bottom of it, which is interesting. So, uh, Sri, are you still there? Oops. Oh, let me see if we can chat with him. Text him and see. See if we can get him back. Oh, he dropped. So, okay, let's see if we can get him back. Hi. You're back. Yeah, sorry about that. Where did I lose you? Uh, just after we talked about Microsoft CEO. Oh, okay. I'm not sure what's going on here. Sorry. Let's try again. I'm going to just hang up and come back okay. in. All right, we see you. Okay, and I think we're screen sharing now. Yes, you are. Good. All right, so here's a... All right, let me see if I can drop in eject. All right, 
Let's see what comes back. All right. Well, while we wait for Sri to come back, let's show you some other things we get it caught up on before we do that. Okay. So one, does everyone know how to get to the American Art Museum? <laughs> Got an idea? So if you go by Metro Gallery Place is the place to go to by Metro. Um, anyone else plan to go by another method? Driving down there. There's parking around there, but you're going to have to do meter and. Make sure you know what you're doing. There are garages down there as well. So, um, if you are interested in staying later, I think it's open until 7:30. So, you're happy to we're happy to have you stay later. I think some of the curators there are going to stay till six um, at that uh, at that library there. Okay, so that's where it is right there. Is it open until seven? Great. I think the weekends open until 7:30, but yeah, I think week, weekdays is seven there. Right? So, make sure we... so don't be fooled if you see signs for National Portrait Gallery. They're attached. They're both like two different halves of the same building. So don't be too afraid if you see that um, that sign instead. So let's go here and make sure we see. Okay, so that's what it looks like there. A from F. Yeah, 7 p.m. Weekend, sometimes 7.30. Okay. All right, let's take a look at your charts here. Okay. Good. Oops, he's coming back. Hey, so are you there? You're kind of back. So we just left again. Right. Oh, joined again. Okay, we'll do one last attempt and then we may just have to finish it off by phone conference and then we'll
That's all right. We can just do it by this. We can just do it by phone if you want. Just finish it off by phone. I think so. Hold on. Let me plug in the uh, audio and see. Oops. Okay. Can you hear me, Sri? Oops. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Can you cable the slides 25? Okay, let me load up slide 25. Uh, where is it? Okay. 25. Figuring out how to collect, study, and use data? Yeah. Okay. Let me see why this isn't going out this side, let's see. Okay, how's it working now? Um, I think I have the screen up. Before, just, yeah. Let's oh, see. now you're back on, you now you're back on here, okay. I just wanted to, I wanted to show, okay, I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna just mute the microphone now on this. Good. But I wanted to show your students this picture from 1996. <laughs> When we were both much younger, this was on the on the roof of the journalism school in Colombia. So let's see if I can. Uh, let me try screen sharing one more time. Otherwise, we'll just I'll just talk. Okay, Andrew. Yeah. Or if you have the screen up, that's fine. Why don't you just use that then? I, I, I got it up. If you want. Yep. Yeah. I yeah. Got it. Thank you. All right. So um, as, as I, I was saying, that data is something that museums have always collected, but it's been about uh, fundraising, donations, as well as admissions numbers. Now we want to collect a lot of different kinds of data, uh, both for, uh, data that comes from our website and our social channels, but also uh, the uh, trying to identify places in the museum. Uh, by where we want to put our effort based on the amount, based on data we've never collected before. So, for example, um, counts in galleries to know during a particular time of day which galleries are more empty than others. Uh, one of the big complaints that people have is they come in and it's so crowded, how do I find anything? So wouldn't it be great if you had a thing that showed you the top ten quietest places at the museum right now? And then people would want to go there. So you know that kind of thing. So that's one of the uh, uh, things that we're doing with data, trying to collect uh, and use it in smarter ways. We have this big event here called the Party of the Year. It's hosted by Anna Wintour of um, Vogue magazine, and it's like the hottest ticket here at the at the Met. And this year, the Costume Institute is honoring Charles James, who is a, a pioneering uh, designer. And uh, this is a kind of event that uh, Beyonce and Kanye West and people like that come to. Uh, I will only be at, be there if I'm working uh, the event and uh, certainly not to attend. Uh, let's see. I'm going on to the next um, slide. Okay. Um, despite all the planning you do, you never know what's going to strike a chord. And let me give you a journalism example of that. Uh, you might know that one of the most emailed articles in the history of the New York Times was about uh, how uh, what a killer whale taught uh, a, a trainer, uh, his, uh, his trainer, about a happy marriage. And this is a lot of tips on how, he, how she learned to take care of her husband or to deal with her husband based on how she dealt with this uh, particular killer whale. And this was an article that ran in 2006 in what's called the Modern Love column in the New York Times. And even though that's buried on page F, in section F21, whatever, it was emailed and seen by millions and millions of people. And uh, I'm sure that day when the New York Times sat around to say, okay, these are the, going to be the articles that are most read, they would not have known that this was going to be that article. And I, I remember getting the print edition of the Times and I wasn't that keen that my wife read this right away, so let's say uh, I can just say that this article kind of disappeared, the section disappeared, but several of her friends just emailed it to her. And uh, this was right when Facebook was getting popular, so it was before Facebook, but people emailed her the article saying, here, you'll learn something about 
your marriage by reading this article. So you never know what's going to strike a chord. We've had that happen here as well um, at the at the Met. You never know what's going to be popular. Uh, here are um, uh, one of our most popular uh, Instagrams has been this kind of collection of real sunflowers that we put up, but we haven't had um, the the sunflowers on the left from Van Gogh. We put that on Instagram, and it may not necessarily get as much attention as this particular thing. So you 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 kind of are never able to predict what's going to be popular, what's going to be big. We have uh, an, our, a cabinet from uh, 19th century, 18th century uh, German designer who created an unusual cabinet, and that's the second most seen uh, museum artwork uh, video on YouTube. Uh, um, it got more than 4 million views. The number one video on YouTube from a museum is from the Natural History Museum about uh, the known universe. So here you have the known universe is number one, and a single cabinet is number two. So you can never predict what's going to be successful. All right, Andrew, we can go to the next slide. And um, experimenting is key to building audiences. Is something we know from journalism in the media world, and we're also thinking about that in uh, what we're doing at the Met. So, for example, we have um, Neil Stimler, who I, I know Andrew knows very well, was, got, uh, was the first to get a Google Glass at the museum. In fact, he's just gotten the second edition of Google Glass. Uh, they've just been released, and he just got his this week. And we now have two of them who are trying to connect and get people engaged and interested in our content using uh, Glass and trying to experiment with that. Uh, we are also trying to collaborate with, with the experts in the museum who are good, who know really what's going on and how to use it as best as we can. So we have this media lab, which, uh, sorry, Andrew, if we can go to the next slide, Me media lab, which shows you how we get um, uh, content, uh, how that's shown and, um, and seen, um, and kind of build this place where looking at kind of the impact of technology on the museum experience is something that we're working on here. Uh, so, for example, one of the best-known parts of the museum is the Temple of Dendor, which is an Egyptian donation to the Met. And this is grand, beautiful room with these uh, uh, a ancient Egyptian architecture. And uh, everybody thinks that the color of the temple are this kind of, uh, you know, sandstone color, but it wasn't. It was actually very brightly lit up. So. Here is an example. If you, Andrew, if you go to the next slide, showing you the recoloring of the temple. Look on the upper right corner. It shows you the kind of bright, almost garish colors of the temple. And uh, we want to. We we can digitally project that onto the temple, and it's an example of the kind of cool new technologies that we are working on at the Met. A couple more things, and then we'll get to your questions. Um, here is uh, an example of an access lab that we do with Parsons uh, School, where we're trying to make sure that people of different abilities are able to uh, access our, our collection. We also have a media lab meetup that we do. And um, if you remember the, um, the cabinet I mentioned, let me just show you, Andrew, if you go to the next slide. Uh, who links to you matters. This is that cabinet I mentioned, and uh, the reason it got all those views on YouTube was because it was linked to by the folks at Gizmodo, and you wouldn't think that Gizmodo would be interested in a, a you know, a 150 year old piece of furniture, but you never know who's going to link to you and what, and they can drive traffic, which is really important. Here's another art break. This is art from. Oceania, Melanesia, um, and just a fun part of the museum. Uh, next slide really gives you a sense of uh, what we, what I talk about at the museum all the time is that there's so much great, wonderful content that we're creating. We don't need to always create new content. What we want to do is to repurpose, redisplay, resurface for folks to see what we're doing. So we have community pages. We have ways in which we want to get more people to see our content. 
at more time, you know, at different times of the day, and uh, make looking at art part of their regular routines. So, Andrew, let me stop here. Um, I have slides that you know you're welcome to share the link with your students if you haven't done so already, where they can look at how we use the different networks: Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and examples of each of these. So um, either they can come up in the questions or um, they can look at it on their own. So let me go back to you, Andrew. Great, great. Um, any questions from folks uh, about what you've seen so far? I mean, I think the, the last thing you talked about, Sri, can you hear us? Yeah, I can. OK. The last thing you talked about was interesting because I think there was just a story last week or a week before. Um, I don't think it was very scientific, but it was it was, I think, a journalist lamenting that even though we have more information online than ever, the amount of original reporting being done actually might have actually decreased over the last few years because of the death of newspapers, et cetera. Um, and that last slide that you had in terms of repurpose, redisplay, resurface, not necessarily getting new things in the collection, but actually doing more with what you have already. Are there some parallels there? I mean, is do you think that news production has gone down, or is it just some crank looking at traditional news production when there's actually lots of interesting stuff happening out there. You know, so I missed that particular um, story, so I haven't, I haven't seen it. Uh, it's something that I will go back and look at. But I will say that there is now more news being produced and consumed than ever before. Uh, it may not be the traditional news outlets, and now we see like Time Magazine, Time Inc. today laid off 500 folks, and you know, lots of terrible things happening. But there are more parts of more cities being covered, where stories are being told, more video being created, more photography being uh, created and consumed. So to say that there is less uh, news con news production is, I think, incorrect. Uh, certainly, we you know there there are we have seen a loss of uh, certain kinds of of journalists, and that's a that's a, that's a real problem. But uh, we're still seeing, I think. Uh, uh, more demand for folks uh, who want this kind of information. We're also seeing uh, younger folks with cameras able to shoot things, cover covering their neighborhoods, their towns. So I think I'm very optimistic about the media business, um, but uh, it is a time of flux and a great consternation. Andrew and I taught at Columbia when there was the dot com bust of nineteen ninety six that nobody even remembers. They all remember the two thousand one, right? Remember Andrew how everybody built up all these services and then everything went down in ninety six, ninety seven, and then it came back again and led up to two thousand and the bust then. So all of this will happen and continue to happen. Uh, the fact that you're all studying media, you're studying communications, those are skills that'll last you a lifetime. And I think there there is going to continue to be a lot of that produced, consumed and, uh, and and demand for people who can do the kinds of things you're learning with Andrew and with your other professors. Great. Um, questions from folks? About what either Sri does or what we're going to be doing in class? Monica? Yeah. I kind of have a question on whether or not they're using, I guess, Wikipedia, so how the museum may be using Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. Since they have all of these articles, are they updating Right. It's a good question. So Monica here had a question about: Is the Met doing anything with Wikipedia right now? Uh, and maybe reflect on what you think of some of the articles in Wikipedia related to either things in the Met collection or things that um, are related to what you do. So obviously, we believe Wikipedia is an incredibly important resource and. Uh, um, and it's something that we want to explore how we can do a better job of uh, getting uh, good solid information into Wikipedia uh, and obviously I'll turn to Andrew for his guidance on this but um, as you know it's what you what you put into it is what you get out of it and so we have there are certain parts of our collection um, uh, where, where there are met references in footnotes and in the reference sections where we see real traffic coming to the Met. But um, I presume that one of the things that some museums are doing, and your class is kind of pioneering and is pioneering this, kind of focused exclusively or you know putting a lot of attention on what Wikipedia can do in terms of, you know, Andrew, are there museums that have every 
every painting also on Wikipedia and on their website, things like that? <laughs> Is there an effort like that? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've got some folks at Smithsonian who are interested in that. Um, it might be the na nature of the fact that they're government funded and they don't need to preserve their income as much as private yes. incomes, but there are folks interested in that. But uh, so is, is it so? I mean, the I know the Met was doing things like that about five to seven years ago, and they got blocked. The the Wikipedia kind of systems blocked updates by Met folks. I think that's all changed now. But that so the Met had started down a path five seven years ago, and then it just stopped because they were blocked from doing kind of updates, even when it was you know in neutral. Third-party type language, I think. right? But I'd love to hear ideas, and if any of you uh, have thoughts on what you'd like to do or how you can help or anything like that, please uh, write to me through Andrew or at Sri at metmuseum.org. If you yeah. uh, want to come spend uh, uh, some time in New York and see what we do up here, or you want to propose a, uh, any, any, you know, if you want an excuse to come and spend part of your summer in New York, let us know. I think some folks here want to go to your Anna Winter party, so. Uh, <laughs> so would I. I would like to go, but I, I, I think tickets are just to give you a sense. Tickets are twenty five thousand dollars, and they were sold out like, you know, several months ago. So even if you had the money, you couldn't go. It's kind of crazy. There is no stub hub for this market. <laughs> but we do live stream the whole thing, so I hope you will. Tune in and just just in. the red carpet or the in interior too. No, the in interior. You know what happens at the Met? They want to stay at the Met, so um, you can only see the outside. But they streamlined for about an hour. I mean, but live stream for about an hour. It's as big as the uh, Oscar red carpet at this point. Yeah, for the fashion, sure. Yeah, right. for the fashion world. Yeah. Right. Um, but of course, as you said, you know, f fashion at the Met is a big thing uh, in terms of visitors, right? Oh yeah, we have this thing called the Costume Institute. This area. And uh, Steve, you know, we had uh, we have these big uh, exhibitions. We pick one designer and do a whole bunch of things around that designer. So last year was Punk. The year before that was Alexander McQueen. And the Alexander McQueen exhibit was the largest in almost any museum over the last five years. So you, you know, and when we when we were creating when the Met, I wasn't here at the time, but when the Met was setting it up, it had no idea it would strike a chord and be so big. And there were other things that happened, including some of his clientele were in the news, as well as his own death. And so there are all kinds of you know, uh, things that happened. But this is where, if you have great content, you still need an element of luck to get it seen to the right people have to find it. But all we can do is get it into the right hands as much as possible and get it out there. Right. So for something like the, the Anna Winter evening, what has the Met had to well? What does the Met do on that evening other than just give access to mainstream media outlets? Do you actually feed and produce anything on your own? Yeah. So uh, this is like a big. This is a way above my pay grade, and is a, <laughs> and I'll be seeing it for the first time. But it's it's a huge, uh, you know, it's like the Fashion Oscar. So they have um, multiple trucks here that are doing live streaming, and uh, they have events, you know, multiple events within the museum. But uh, what my department does is we'll be doing a live stream out of that to get people around the world to get a, at least a, a, a light taste of what's going on inside. But that's a good example of how museums are no longer just warehouses and displays of stuff after the fact. This is actually a production that you're more used to seeing out of a media organization. Right? And that's also why we want it. We, we, we focus on the 3D printing, and we want the museum to be a place of making not mm -hmm. just uh, you know looking and archiving. Uh, the person who does that for us here is a guy named Don Undine. D his, his Twitter handle is at Don, U-N-D-E-N. -E uh, and he is uh, the go-to guy on 3D printing and the media. He runs our media lab. So in your research and work, if you ever need any help, Don's a good guy to get to. Great. Great. Any questions from folks? Yeah, Tina. I noticed that he's a professor in Facebook for 90 years, so mm -hmm. I don't know uh, what kind of ability is the most important for students if you want to be a journalist in the future. So Tina asked, what's 
since you've taught journalism for so long, what are some of those most important abilities for a journalist today that you'd recommend folks? Well, getting, getting, we, one of our former colleagues, a guy named Sig Gisler, G-I-S-S-L-E-R, Sig Gisler, uh, coined a wonderful term. He's the director of the Pulitzer Prizes. By the way, Andrew, did you see he's stepping down? He's retired? Yeah, I heard. So Sig um, has this wonderful term he coined called the tradigital journalist. <laughs> T-R-A digital journalist. The traditional journalist with a digital overlay. So that's something that we really emphasize. That you want somebody who understands all the values and has all the skills of traditional journalism, knows how to get a story, how to get it right, how it knows how to shoot and edit and do all those things but knows has this digital overlay which means it allows and, and allows him or her to be able to engage with audiences, uh, get the story out, own your brand, own your story, understand social media. All of those things are absolutely critical if you want to be successful in, in today's uh, journalistic world. So you need that combination. So think of yourself as digital journalists and you will be successful. Um, other questions? Yeah, we have another question. Well, to follow up, like, what kind of like news media outlet do you follow as a journalist? What kind of like news do you So, what uh, news media outlets do you follow, and what would you recommend for folks to to read more of? Yeah, so I've had to change my media diet once I came to the Met because I now had to read a lot more, uh, you know, world of the arts. But I would say, as as journalists, as communicators, you should still be reading uh, places that are uh, trying to understand not just what is happening in the world of news, but also uh, why it's happening. So places like Neiman Lab and CJR and AJR. Uh, a pointer is still very important to me. P O Y N T R. I'm sure. Uh, you're familiar with it. These are all places where we want to understand what's happening in the, in the, in the industry. And so uh, those, are, those are things I read. Then, of course, uh, all the, uh, the big um, uh, news websites that uh, are, are trying to uh, tell stories in new ways. You've seen the Atlantic Wire has just rebranded itself. They're trying to do new things. Um, I still, Andrew, you believe I still read Drudge. And, uh -huh. uh, because one of the reasons I read it is that it gives you a sense of what is, because it still drives the news agenda. In lots of newsrooms, people look at Drudge to see what's going on, and they put that on the evening news and on, on their websites. So it's a way of getting a sense of what's going to be news based on this one very unobjective, biased person's point of view. <laughs> How many people here have read Drudge Report in the last week? Zero hands. Interesting. So let me just give you the latest statistics. In the last 24 hours, he's had 29 million visits. In the last month, 800 million visits. But he's not read by young people, which is right. what we're obviously seeing <laughs> in, in displayed in front of you. What do you guys think of the New York Times relaunch uh, of the website? Did you guys study that at all or look at it? No, we didn't. OK. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy around that, so if you get a chance, you should take a look. All right. They redesigned the front page of the website. Yeah, it's a lot more white space than before. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, it does look like the Washington Post. Yeah, yeah, it looks a little bit more newspapery than before. So, by the way, my office looks a lot like your classroom. You see that corner? <laughs> well, hold on, let's see here. This corner right there looks a lot like. Uh, your office, <laughs> that that uh, slanted roof over there looks just like your your classroom. We're, we're saying that too. Like slant is the new <laughs> in here, right? so we got yeah, slant. Slant. Good. But what I have outside, let me just show you the view because Andrew has not been here yet. Andrew, when are you coming to visit? Uh, <laughs> soon. But wow, what is that? It's a bridge. Okay, so that's that's there's New York. Well, you can't really see New York City, but this is on a beautiful day. I I'm looking right into the. The ancient Roman, Greek and Roman uh, sculpture courtyard. So, nice. Yeah. Where's the, where the office, by the way? Your, their office is next to Central Park, or in Central Park, technically, right? Yeah, they're all. Uh, we only have one. But we there are basically two buildings: the Cloisters, which is in Upper Upper Manhattan, which is medieval art, and then the main Met building, which is on the Upper East Side, the 
right next to where Jackie Kennedy used to live. You were in Central Park. Yeah. Where the uh, Imagine thing was. It's on the other side of the park of that. Yeah. Right. Great. Yeah. Like it's more like personal interest about the party of the year, the vote, and which were they. Do you guys? Hi. Uh, do you guys like have volunteer for that, or how? To, if I want to contribute to that event, what should I do? Uh, unfortunately, you know the volunteer pool is full of uh, is filled also months and months in advance. Uh, but um, I, you know, one thing that you might want to do as part of the uh, part of the work you're doing for Andrew's class is maybe beef up that uh, party of the year entry in Wikipedia. You know, I've never looked at it. I don't even know what's in there. But um, that's the kind of thing that um, if, if you do a really good job with it, I can send it on to Anna and say, hey, here are the people who, who, who did that. Of course, I just did party of the year. Let's see. I don't know. It's the, the, I don't think that's what it's called. It's probably called the Met Gala. That's why you have to find it. So that will be the first, first assignment. That would be a great article improvement drive. The Met Ball, is that what it is? Met Ball, yeah. Met Ball is what it's called. But it is pretty it's very clean. It's pretty it's very clean. When is it again? It's in May this year. May, okay. Yeah, there you go. May fifth. It's on the right. It's on. It's that's there. Right, but it certainly could use some some more. That's right. You can okay. make Anna happy, guys. <laughs> well, that's a good way to. I, I was telling folks that's a great way to get on the radar screen, is to say I was the one who. Did this major upgrade to that article that you know gets a hundred thousand views a day or something like that? Right? So, so here's here's a here's a tip that we, what I would say is whenever you work on and this to me I don't Andrew there must be some word for a this is not a stub but it's like one step above a stub right right or so, or I mean it's not bad but there could be so much that no picture there's so much more we could do with this that sure. if I were uh, one of your students and I wanted to work on this first thing I do is I take screen grabs of this and then. Send people when you send people a link to the final thing. I would also uh, include the screen grab so they can see what you did. Right. In journalism, you want to be able to really show showcase what you what you've done, but also tell them the story of the journey that your your stuff made across as well. Right, right. Yeah, before and after, and who knows if you improve it really substantially this next year, maybe you'll get a press credential next year for this thing. <laughs> <laughs> And when I when I when I look at this, you know the um, uh, yeah, like the thing it's linking to is the is not the right page. So there there's 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 a lot of work that needs to be done needs to be done here. Right. right. And uh, you guys can you guys can do it. Good. That's a good project for someone. Nice. All right. Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, any last questions before we let Sri go? We don't want to take up all his time today, but. Well, thanks so much, Sri. And uh, oh, no, my pleasure, guys. And you are so lucky to spend all this time with Andrew. I'm very jealous. And uh, please uh, keep in touch. My email is three at netmuseum.org. Andrew, if you send them that link to the uh, uh, to that particular ex uh, the Google Doc, they can see details of how we do Twitter, how we do Facebook, how we do Pinterest, and Instagram. So I think they'll learn a lot from looking at those. Right. I'll send them that that document. Yeah. All right, thanks a lot, Sri. Okay, thank you guys. Good luck. Bye. Bye.